press briefing of, of 2021. Uh, the order business today is that I will talk you through the overview, forecast overview, and then the consumption investment and trade sections of the commentary. And then I'm going to hand over to Kieran, who is going to talk through the labour market, public finances and, and the general assessment. Uh, before we start, I'd like to, to welcome Ilias Kostarakas to the teams. It's his uh, first contribution to, to the QEC team. So I'd just like to welcome him and thanks uh, to the Ilias for all his inputs uh, into the commentary this time. Uh, around. So just bear with me one second while I, I share the presentation here. Okay, great. So let me uh, let me just talk through the um, the overview. Obviously, since uh, the winter commentary at the end of last year, there has been a significant deterioration in the epidemiological situation in Ireland. Uh, in in the at the end of 2020, we, we had expected some degree of, uh, of stringent public health measures would be required in, in the first quarter of this year. But obviously, the, the imposition of the level five measures uh, seen from January onwards has been much more extensive uh, than we had previously expected. And, and uh, certainly looks like it will continue for longer than we, we had envisaged in the previous quarter. And that's really the, the context and the backdrop for, for uh, changes in our assessment of, of economic developments since the onset uh, of, 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 of the year. And that is, that is, is what will contextualize the, the, the findings mainly from, from our assessment today. Notwithstanding uh, the, the major uh, economic shock that, that was caused by the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the, uh, the extensive disruption to, to social and economic life, the Irish economy did have a strong growth performance uh, last year and uh, this was driven by the, the the really extraordinary performance of particular export sectors particularly the pharmaceuticals and the computer services sectors um, and the the drop in in imports so na naturally the major contribution of net trade to economic growth was what uh, caused a, a a growth outturn last year which is which was which is very very strong in a pan-european context um, so certainly the Irish economy growing last year was, was uh, quite extraordinary in the context of, of the broader European uh, economic situation. Uh, that contrasts quite markedly with, with the deterioration in the domestic economy. Obviously, one of the variables that we would track quite strongly in terms of the, the, uh, the measurement, the domestic activity is, is the consumption channel. And consumption was down 9% last year, which is, which is a very a large year-on-year -year a contraction in, in domestic activity and investment fell quite strongly uh, into throughout last year, although part of that is explained by changes in, in some of the multinational activities, but there was still a, a contraction in the, the domestic component of investment as well. So uh, in general, um, we, we, had, uh, we had expected uh, quite a strong outturn for this year. We, we still are expecting a considerable growth this year. Uh, so our forecast for growth is 4.4% for this year and, and stronger for next year. Um, but these, but in particular around the consumption channel, we have moderated quite substantially our forecast from, from the winter commentary. And that reflects the, the, the longer duration of the ongoing public health measures that, that, are, that, that are, have been uh, required to, to control uh, the COVID-19 infections. So let me just give you a, a short overview. Uh, of, of our main summary findings. So uh, focusing first on that consumption channel, which is the channel that we uh, put a lot of weight on in terms of its, its, its ability to provide a, an on the ground guidance to what's happening in Ireland. Um, obviously it came down 9% as I've said last year, which is, which is quite a, a dramatic fall. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, very much reflects the, the, the challenges that were faced uh, from an economic perspective within uh, the, the, the Irish economy. For this year, uh, we're, we're expecting consumption to grow at just under 7%, so about 6.7%. That is uh, down markedly on our expectation uh, from, the, from the end uh, of, of last year. And that reflects the fact that we are going to have stricter public health measures for a longer period of time in 2021 than we previously expected. And, and that, is, that is what is dropping, pulling down our, our consumption. Uh, forecast for this year. 
for next year, we, we do see uh, quite a strong rebound in, in consumption. That's something we've been we've been noting for a number of commentaries now, uh, and, and our expectation around that is that we'll, we'll re recover strongly once we're in a position to have a more broad-based economic activity without the requirement for strict public health uh, measures. And you know, as as the as the vaccine program rolls out, likely to be to be uh, you know a broad-based vaccination towards the end of this year we do see uh, the ability for, of, of household spending to recover quite strongly in that context because of, of increased savings that has happened uh, over the pandemic period. Um, well, obviously, one of the features of the, the economic situation for, for last year was a strong increase in, in public sector spending, which uh, uh, quite correctly took the place of the withdrawal of private sector activity. And you can see the, the strong growth in public spending uh, last year and you know, we, we're expecting that to come down slightly in growth rate terms for this year and next year, but, but still strong uh, uh, increases in, in, in public spending on a year on year basis. Investment came down quite strongly last year. That, that is, uh, obviously, there, there was a deterioration in, in the, the economic climate and firms pulled back on investment. Some, some of these, the, the big change uh, in the Irish figures is caused by, by changes in machine or equipment, which is driven by some of the multinational activities. and um, that naturally uh, doesn't necessarily reflect the general economic trends, but, but, but investment did come down, particularly building construction investment uh, on a year on year basis, reflected the deteriorating economic situation. Really, the, the, um, the, the strong performance of, of, of the, the export channel really is, the, is what stands Ireland out relative to, to other peers. Uh, we, we had a very strong export growth uh, last year. We expect that to continue uh, into this year and, and, and next year. And that will provide a, a, a considerable stimulus uh, to, to, the, to the economy. Putting all that together, then we, we expect growth of just under five and four and a half percent uh, this year and uh, under uh, just over five percent uh, for next year. I, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about the consumption channel in, in a few minutes, but uh, I guess we would note that on, on the consumption forecasts, the, the longer that the required public health measures are in place, uh, the the Obviously, the lower we would expect our consumption outturn to be this year. So there are potentially risks on the. I think the risks are to the downside on our consumption forecast, um, for 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 twenty twenty one. To to just look at the uh, the contribution to growth, I think this is a, this is a nice way of thinking about what elements are, are providing the the growth stimulus uh, in, in the Irish economy. You can see uh, last year uh, in twenty twenty the consumption and investment channels were the ones that were providing the negative contribution to growth and then the traded side was was what was giving the the, the positive stimulus to to the economy and i think that is that's an important part of the story to understand what 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 is, is contributing to to the irish uh, irish uh, outturn you can you can see the, the little red bar here is the, is the public spending the net net current uh, public spending and obviously that provided a, a positive stimulus to the economy last year, which you can see in the, the small uh, red bar. For, 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 for 2021 and 2022, you can see again, we're, we are expecting that uh, trade will provide uh, most of the, in particular the, 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 the export channel will provide quite considerable contribution to growth, but the import channel will, will outweigh some of that. Uh, obviously last year with imports declining, that, uh, that obviously is, is positive for growth if, if imports uh, decline. So we would expect imports to, to rise uh, in 2021 and 2022, and, and this will, will, will provide a more traditional uh, net trade effect. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about uh, consumption. Uh, in terms of the, the, the fall for this year, it was kind of in the mid range of, of, of other European uh, economies on a year-on-year on year basis. Um, we had a forecast quite a strong rebound, double-digit rebound in the winter commentary, but we, we've pulled that back markedly in this particular commentary and that um, is, is very much uh, dep dependent on the longer uh, duration of the public health measures that have been in place since the onset of the, the, the wave from, from January 2020 onwards. Um, I think you know when we're, we're thinking about the outturn for consumption, and um, it's critical that the rollout of the vaccines 
uh, goes as, as as rapidly as, as supply allows it to. And naturally, the 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 recovery towards more normalized consumption patterns really is dependent on the relaxation of the, the public health measures. And we, you know, we're still expecting that to happen in the second half of the year. And you know, certainly at that stage, we, we would hope that the, there will be more flexibility to, to relax the, the stringent public health measures, allowing households to undertake more, more expenditure uh, activities. And um, one of the features uh, for Ireland, which I, which I think is, is useful to note is that we had a very dramatic increase in the savings rate. Uh, and, and if you compare it, which this chart here does, uh, to other European countries, you can see Ireland is in the orange dashed line here. And you know, pre-pandemic, we would have had very, very similar uh, savings ratios uh, compared to, to other uh, countries. So this is the, the proportion of, of disposable income that's saved relative to consumed. And you can see Ireland was very much in the middle uh, of, of the European uh, distribution. During the, the pandemic, you can see which kicked in uh, quarter two, 2020, we actually were the highest in terms of the savings, uh, the growth savings ratio, and uh, we still have a high savings ratio towards the end of this year relative to the pre-pandemic uh, period. And we, we, you know, we certainly uh, feel this is an area uh, which provides uh, a lot of scope for for a, a non-policy-based domestic stimulus. If households have more savings, then they should be able to to use those savings to consume. Uh, when uh, the, the public health measures are, are relaxed and, and certainly the accumulation of savings here uh, that we, we, we are documenting, we, we think should be able to provide a, a growth stimulus once households are able to make that expenditure. Obviously there are a number of caveats to that. Some households may choose to pay down debt uh, and the, the composition of the, of the savings uh, the, across the income distribution also matter. For example, if these savings are being accumulated by higher income households, these households may be less likely to save, to spend for every euro that they that they earn. So therefore, uh, the, the overall impact of, of an unwinding of these savings rates uh, may not necessarily give a give a one-to-one -one impact, but we, we certainly think that there are savings there that can be uh, used uh, as, as part of the, 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 the stimulus once the public health measures are, are unwound. To talk a little bit about uh, uh, the investment channel, I've, I've mentioned this before, you know, we've been big drops in, in, in a majority of the items at the subcomponents of the investment, particularly the machine and equipment. And, but you can see the building and construction, which is much more related to, to on the ground activity by Ireland, came down by, by nearly by over 9% last year. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's an important component of the drop. Um, we, we, in terms of the, the uh, housing completions, obviously the, the, uh, in the winter commentary, we, we hadn't expected a, a level five, um, set of measures which would have contained a, 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 a restriction on, on the housing market and, and naturally with the with, the, with those restrictions being in place the we've moderated our, our, our housing completions forecasts and um, you know we, we're, we're, we're looking at, at uh, 15,000 this year and, and, and 16,000 next year but I think again that the longer these measures are in place and the longer they're required that the risks really are on the downside to, to, to these figures. Obviously, one of the the uh, the issues that that has been quite stark around the crisis has been a, a drop in corporate insolvencies, which is obviously linked to the investment uh, channel. Um, in Ireland, we also have seen a drop in insolvencies last year, which is and, and the IMF are noting that on a global scale. This is uh, obviously there's a number of factors driving this, but the extensive policy supports are likely to be playing quite a considerable role, and. Uh, the, the difficulty here will be the extent to which companies are, are able to survive the longer the period in which public health measures are, are, are required, and also the extent to which there, there is a rebound and, and how and when the policy measures are tapered. So a number of effects are here. <clears throat> so on the, on the trade channel, I've mentioned uh, uh, a number of the, the, the key developments and the, really the, the Irish Growth story last year is a, is an export story and it's a concentrated export story, and you can see the the, the stark contribution of growth in, in, in particular areas, medicine, medicinal, pharmaceutical, consumer services activities, are the the contributing factors to to why uh, Ireland had a a considerable uh, net trade contribution to, to economic activity uh, last year, and uh, while there was a decline in in, in import activity. 
the growth and export really was the, the, the main story uh, around this. You can see this chart here really uh, highlights the size of the, the concentration of the exports by commodity. So you can see on the left-hand chart, the service exports by commodity and you, you, the computer services make up a very large component of that. On the right-hand chart, you can see the merchandise exports by commodity. You can see the, the medicinal pharmaceutical products make up a very large component of that. And their uh, positive growth outturn uh, last year really are, are contributing factors to, to the positive uh, trade uh, contribution to the economy. Obviously, talking about trade without mentioning Brexit is, is probably uh, not a good idea. So, so uh, we, we, um, we provide some insight into, into developments uh, since the uh, transition period ended and, and the UK now has the, the trade deal that uh, was agreed. One of the, the difficult, obviously, the, the January 2021 figures um, show quite a marked drop in, in EU or EU UK trade, both in exports and imports. And also uh, with with the on the Irish side, obviously one of the difficulties here with with directly relating these to Brexit is that the introduction of the the, the trade deal coincided with the reimposition of the, the stringent public health measures, and um, in both Ireland and in the UK. Uh, so uh, there are obviously difficulties directly relating these changes to to purely the traded side, however, as the consumption bundle was changed in both countries with public health measures. So certainly as we get more months data in, we will get a better picture on, on what's happening on the trade side, but it's undoubtedly that the, the Brexit effect is, is coming through into the trade data now. I think that's that's clear from, from, from the figures. Okay, so at this point, uh, I'm gonna hand over to, to Kieran to talk about the labor market and the public finances and uh, the general assessment. Thanks very much, Connor, and good morning to everybody. Um, Connor, you can just uh, pull it up to full uh, slideshow there, if that's okay. Sure. So, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so as, as Connor has said, I mean, obviously a lot of our outlook is conditioned by the assumptions uh, in terms of the, the nature of the government restrictions. And uh, obviously de a lot depends on how successful the, the rollout of the vaccination uh, program is for the remainder of the year. So our unemployment, uh, while we see, you know, strong, relatively strong growth this year and next year, uh, we see unemployment is still remaining, you know, relatively high. So, you know, we see it falling quite sharply, obviously, from the, the peak in, in the first quarter of the present year at 25%. Um, but by the end of the year, we still see unemployment at uh, just over 10%. And we also see uh, running through next year, we have an average of unemployment rate of just over 7%, but we still see unemployment above 6% by the end of 2022. And to a certain extent, I suppose that just reflects the nature of the Irish labor market that it, you know, whilst, you know, we will see sharp fall in unemployment initially, uh, it, it will take time, I think. It will take a number of years really before we get back to the uh, level and the rate of unemployment that we had prior uh, to the pandemic. So you can see, there we provide some information on the nature of the, the supports uh, that have been provided and in particular the numbers of people uh, who are um, uh, you know in receipt of both the pandemic uh, payment and the EWSS. Uh, Connor there if you just move on to the next slide um, you will see um, yeah so you see our the, the nature of the unemployment rate uh, over the last uh, period of time. So again, you see this gradual decline in unemployment from under 10% back in 2016, down to the pre-pandemic low of around 4.9% in February of last year. Very sharp increase uh, with the government restrictions peaking at over 30% in April. And then it comes back down. And I suppose this provides some indication to us of what is likely to happen once we have an easing of the government restrictions, uh, it, the present government restrictions, uh, and as the vaccination uh, program becomes more successful through the latter half of the year, that fall off in the unemployment rate from 30% down to 15% last year gives you some indication of what is likely to happen to the unemployment rate. Obviously, then it's gone back up to the present high of 25% uh, because of the, the level five restrictions. Um, some information there on the, the number of people, both on the pulp and the live register. So the live register is traditional unemployment uh, payment, if you like, and support measures. Uh, and then the pulp being obviously the measures that were introduced uh, in response to the crisis. So you can see it peaked in May of last year at 605,000 people on the pulp. Uh, down then to a you know a relative low of 210,000 in September, 
before back up to 480,000 in January of the present year. So you can see very huge fluctuations in the numbers of people on the support payments, um, uh, whilst the numbers on the live register remaining relatively constant at around 220, 230,000 uh, people. So if we go on to the next slide, we can see, and this is drawing on work from our, our colleagues in the tax uh, welfare benefit uh, side of the house. So they did, um, you know, our switch, using the switch model, they did detailed analysis of the costings uh, of the, the pandemic payments and the, uh, the subsidy schemes. And what's interesting, if you look at this table, so what this is breaking out is the cost per 100,000 displaced workers on a monthly basis in millions. So this is how much it costs basically, if you like, in terms of all the support measures. Um, and they include both the direct measures, so the, the traditional unemployment me uh, payments, uh, so that would be the, uh, there in, in column or row B, see the change in welfare expenditure. They also include the pandemic payments and they include the wage subsidy schemes. And then they also include the reduction in government revenue coming from the tax, so the, the fall off in tax revenue. So then you get a net exchequer impact there at the, the bottom of the, the table. But the, the takeaway message from this is that you can see overall it's costing just under 200 million um, euros per, an, or per month uh, per 100,000 displaced workers. That's the overall cost to the exchequer. Uh, what's interesting from this, though, is that whilst the pandemic payment and the, the wage subsidy scheme have gotten a lot of attention, uh, what the analysis, what their analysis actually shows is that the traditional welfare payments, so the automatic stabilizers, if you like, provide them the lion's share of the support. So they account for around, uh, you know, 70, 70 million, as you can see there, uh, in terms of, uh, if you look at the difference between the no policy response and the policy response, basically that gives you an idea. So the, the traditional support measures uh, would result in the cost to the exchequer being 144 million. Whereas when you bring in the additional, the PUP and the wage subsidy scheme, it increases to 190, but it's, you know, that the lion's or the majority is provided essentially by the traditional uh, welfare payments or the the traditional automatic stabilizers, if you like, which kick in. If we then move on to the next um, uh, slide, you see our, our overall view on the public finances. And we're now saying that last year, the government had a general government balance of approximately minus 19.7 billion, which approximated to around five and a half percent of GDP. Um, the debt GDP ratio as a result uh, was around 61% last year. Um, we also have estimates, obviously, for debt to GNI Star. This year, because of the the nature of the government restrictions and the fact that we still have a, a substantial number of people, both on the pulp and on the well and on the subsidy scheme, as well as obviously on the traditional welfare payment, it means that we're going to run a sizable deficit again this year of around eighteen and a half billion, which will approximately be around four point seven percent of GDP, which will result in the debt to GDP ratio increasing, but increasing only marginally. Uh, because the economy is, is, is expected to increase, uh, you know, relatively strong uh, growth rates this year and next year. So you actually see next year, even though uh, we're again expecting a deficit of somewhere in the region of around 2% next year because of the higher unemployment rate, uh, you actually see that the debt to GDP ratio has actually has fallen back a little bit compared to where it w was uh, in 2020. Uh, and that's because the economy has grown at a faster pace than the, the, if essentially the debt level. We expect to see, um, you know, whilst most of the taxation items last year, taxation headings experienced declines, um, particularly the kind of VAT, excise duties, etc. Um, income tax only registered a 1% decline last year, which was quite significant. And again, that, that I suppose, points to the idea of the, the dual economy. And, and we've, we've, we've talked about that quite a bit in previous commentaries um, in terms of the, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic. Corporation taxes, we talked about this in the last commentary, but again, you know, it, it, it's clear, I think, that the incoming uh, administration in the United States is going to have a, you know, a different perspective and a different take on corporation tax policy, uh, and that could have implications for corporation tax receipts down the line. And so we, we, we've, you know, that allied to the unsustainable, what we would term, uh, some of the, the large increase in corporation tax receipts in the last few years clearly have had an unsustainable or, or bubble component. And so that's led us to be quite uh, moderate in our, uh, our forecast for corporation tax receipts this year and next year. We do expect a significant bounce back in some of the other tax headings as the economy opens up. Uh, and we also expect, obviously, expenditure to remain elevated this year. Uh, and even next year, there will be uh, still increases in expenditure above and beyond what otherwise would have occurred. Okay, uh, if we go to the next slide, 
Um, we in the box or in the commentary, we have we follow up the analysis we did last time around on debt sustainability to look at another measure of debt sustainability, which is. Um, uh, gained uh, some degree of attention uh, in recent times, which is work by Larry Summers uh, and a colleague. Larry Summers, very well respected, obviously, US economist. Uh, and he's looked at this notion of um, the real interest uh, payments to, de to GDP and using this as a concept uh, and contrasting it with the traditional kind of debt to GDP concept that's used, for example, in, in the EU fiscal framework. Uh, what this measure does, the, the real interest payments to GDP does, is it incorporates the fact that, of course, we have very, very low uh, interest rates put on, uh, you know, on, on our debt payments at present and are likely to experience low, debt pay, low interest uh, rates going forward. And this, to a certain extent, changes the game a little bit in terms of what governments can do from a fiscal perspective. So the box kind of draws out uh, the, 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 the kind of implications of this. Uh, and what it suggests is that if you were, for example, to use such a rule, and we're not necessarily advocating it, but we're saying that this is a rule that has gained quite a lot of attention in recent times. Uh, if you were to use such a rule, it would suggest that there's more fiscal, there's more scope for fiscal policy uh, as far as the domestic response is concerned than using the traditional kind of metrics that are used as per the, the EU fiscal framework, i.e. the debt to GDP. And I think that's an important point. And we'll discuss it there in, in a minute in terms of the, the overall assessment. So if we move on then just to the final slide. Um, so our overall assessment is that we still think that there will be strong economic growth this year, um, following up from last year. So we, we expect the economy to grow by 4.4% this year, 5.2% next year. Clearly that's heavily conditional on the assumptions that we've made about the pandemic and about the nature of the vaccination program, which we assume will be, you know, most of the population will be uh, vaccinated through Q3 and Q4 of this year. We expect consumption in particular to bounce back investment as well. We expect continue to expect a strong traded performance. So we, we think that whilst maybe some of the sectors that did very well last year because of the pandemic may not do as well this year, you know, from a, a more broader based perspective, you will expect to see a strong growth performance in, 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 in the traded sector because most of the economies that we're trading with will begin to recover through the latter half of this year. Housing completions, um, you know, again, we, we, we think this will be one of the, the longer term implications or longer term uh, victims, if you like, of, of COVID is the impact on the supply side of the housing market. So, you know, we've revised downwards our expectation for, for housing units this year, 15,000. That may be even optimistic at the present time. We will be reviewing it clearly as the year progresses. But as I said, it could be one of the big, uh, you know, one of the big longer term costs of, of, of the pandemic is the impact on the supply side of the housing market. Uh, finally, then, you know, I think a key issue and it comes out of the box that I just discussed is, you know, we believe that the, the fiscal framework at an EU level clearly has to be has to be looked at and has to be, um, you know, we think has to be overhauled in the light of the crisis. Uh, I think the low interest rate environment that, that most countries are going to experience over the coming years has changed the whole context around the fiscal rules. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed and we need to see, you know, significant reform of the fiscal rules going forward. It's clear we still need to maintain discipline uh, on the public finances front and particularly for a small open economy like ourselves. But we think the rules need to be changed in such a way as to allow European countries to, to be able to invest in key physical and, and social infrastructure, in particular, you know, the green technologies uh, from a, an environmental perspective at a, an EU wide level, but also from a country specific perspective, the likes of ourselves who've had kind of uh, major shortfalls in investment in areas like social housing. We believe that, you know, these rules need to be allowed, need to be modified to allow greater uh, government scope in, in, in investment in these areas. Okay, so that's uh, the, the presentation. 